students are. In my course, they don't have to write more papers after this week. But uh, they're off, uh, I think, education is one choice or the other. But before I introduce um, Rip, uh, I'd like to go around the table as, so that he'll know who everybody is. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about his background, and then we'll be off and running. So, who would like to you? Yes, that's right. The last person didn't get the chance to go first. Hang on, this is Rip. Mary Malkins, I'm a trustee of the local foundation. Rip and I met uh, Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation, senior fellow. Jim Smith. Yeah, you met, but not everybody knows who you are. Connie Carter at the <laughs> University of North Carolina Public Policy Department. He, he was formerly the President of the Foundation. He sort of had a hiding of the professor. That's in Florida. Yeah, that's in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not a Floridian? No, he's a Mississippi. That's <laughs> The no, one lady at my birth. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> we knew this would happen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Drea Design Madison Triangle Community Foundation. Kate hey, Alport, Health Research Alliance, based at Pearl Open Fund. I'll be happy with the North Carolina Network of Group Members. And Crystal Dawson, on the faculty here at Pearl Open Paul Dunn, long since retired many years ago from the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Carnegie Foundation to be bad for the people. That's when they worked closely together. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we we'll talk about that sometime. Okay, I'll be delighted. I'm Laura Dunham, Alden's wife, and I'm here for the Detroit Connection. I'm very interested in what Presby is doing to help revitalize the city. I'm Greg Beatty, I'm the faculty of the business. I'm the Krishnan on the faculty here at Public Policy. I'm Matt Newberg. I'm a law clerk for our federal judge. An expert on incentivizing prizes. Right? <laughs> I'm Jonathan. I'm a PC fellow from South Korea. Nice to see you. See you again. Malin Glassman, coordinator of the Foundation Research Program. Thanks. Stephen Schumer. Good afternoon. Uh, student of uh, Law and Public Policy and Assistant to Professor Fleischman. I'm uh, Richard Schmalbeck. I'm a professor in the law school here. Barry Varela, I'm the case writer for the Duke Foundation Research Program. Ginger Solomon, I'm on the board of CARE and the Love Club. I'm freshly back from Tanzania yeah. mm -hmm. um, within the last week. I'm Nancy Stone, I'm with the Girls Walk and Find Out in Research Triangle. I'm Ray Jacobson, I'm the Chief Investment Officer for the Golden Age Foundation. You better tell me what Golden Age Foundation is. It uh, receives half of North Carolina's tobacco settlements for its own. Oh. And its mission is to promote rural economic development across the state. So there's our there's our crew today, and we thank you all for coming. Um, it's a real pleasure to have Rick Rapson here. Uh, he is one of the most dynamic foundation presidents around. Um, uh, he he is a lawyer by training, Columbia Law School. Uh, he worked for Congressman Donald Fraser uh, when he was in Washington and then later became deputy mayor when Donald Frazier became mayor of, of Minneapolis. Um, he, uh, he, comes, he went to the, um, uh, to the Kresge Foundation after a really extraordinary tour of duty uh, as president of the Knight Foundation uh, in Minneapolis. And those of you who know the Midwest, um, and particularly Minnesota, will know that the Knight Foundation uh, is, is really the major player there in terms of sparking good things uh, in the state and in the city, uh, and had a number of really successful collaborative efforts between the Unite Foundation and other foundations and, uh, and state government and nonprofits uh, in the state of Minnesota. I mean, I like to think that, uh, it, that, that the Unite Foundation has played the same kind of role in, 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 in Minnesota as the Zeesman Farms Foundation has played in North Carolina over the years, uh, and that's a high compliment. Um, but uh, having, having, after he left uh, the, from the Knight Foundation, he was appointed president of the Kresge Foundation, and he's going to talk to us today about the, uh, uh, his, well, you saw the title, uh, and he's going to put flesh on the bones of the title uh, of his talk about uh, uh, the cha change at the, at the Kresge Foundation. Uh, we didn't get Ta, <laughs> you didn't say who you were. Well, I'm Todd Cohen with the Philanthropy Journal, which is a publication of the um, an online publication of the Age Foundation. We were 
report on the land for being on the bus. And the reason that I thought that I should say something that I remember Todd having an was I was about to say that that this is, uh, as all these sessions are off the record, and yeah. that so that the, um, the speaker can feel free to speak knowing he's not going to be quoted. And uh, so I leave, I leave that to everybody knows that, and uh, I, that's the reason why we do it. So with that, uh, let me thank you so much for coming. Rick gave a terrific talk in my class this morning about the, the, the nitty gritty of the, of the collaborative that we put together out there to uh, reshape the way Minneapolis was growing, uh, which involved a large number of participants. And the class was fascinated by it. We're going to hear a different side now, not what he did before, but what he's doing now. So Rick, thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. Uh, very nice. And warm introduction, I appreciate it. Um, I, I have to tell you, I, I really struggled with um, how to come at the, the time, um, given that you've had Susan Beresford and Jonathan Benton head swoop in this chair, and, and given that Joel's book is now a selection of the Oprah Book of the Month Club. Um, <laughs> I, I, I figured that the kind of talk that I did this morning to the class just wasn't particularly uh, Compelling. It just I can't. I don't think I can offer any particular insights at sort of the macro level of what's going on in philanthropy or, or in terms of um, any of the kind of research that people around the table are doing. Yeah. Um, but what I thought I might do, uh, if you'll indulge me, and it, it is a little bit self-serving, is describe some of the changes that are going on at my foundation, Presley Foundation, in the hopes that it will be somewhat interesting, and that in fact you will perhaps push back and make sure that we get it right because we're right at the front end of, of this work, and it would be, I think, very interesting and helpful to me to get your reactions to whether you think what we're doing is off base or, or not, and it's quite possible that it is. I've been at Kresge all of about seven months, so this is uh, still a sort of formative period, not only for trying to figure out what direction we're going to head in, um, but also quite how to do it and how my leadership style is the organization, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So I thought I would divide my remarks into five sections. Doesn't It will not be as daunting as that, but let me at least divide it up into neat little pieces. One is I'm going to talk a little bit about the Presby tradition, just because uh, some of you are familiar with it, but some of you may not be, and it's uh, sort of a predicate for what will follow. Um, the second is a, a, a critique of that tradition, some of the things that I think were misfiring with some consistency at Kresge and, and why that became a, an impetus for change. Uh, third, a uh, handful of principles that we reached for to try to guide the change at Kresge. Um, fourth, the framework that emerged out of that, and then I'll just touch very briefly at the end on just some of the early operational implications of pursuing this new course. So let me talk first about the Kresge tradition. I think as many of you may know, Kresge Foundation was established um, in the early 20s by Sebastian Kresge to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the founding of, of the department store chain. I keep realizing that folks on the east don't have the same relationship to Kresge Five and Dimes as those of us in the Midwest, but these were wonderful sort of neighborhood anchoring institutions that uh, sprinkled the upper Midwest, particularly um, well into the, into the 50s and the 60s. It ultimately uh, became an empire of almost 600 stores, which became Kmart. Um, and and uh, Kmart's story is now history, I guess. And I'm not sure where Kmart is, somewhere in the halls of Sears, I think. Um, but it is, it is still a proud tradition and one that um, traces back um, traces back now almost uh, 100 years. Um, from the earliest days, the foundation established a very clear focus on building nonprofit organizations um, by supporting their physical expansion, capital grants, uh, as, a, as a way of making sure that those organizations would serve ever growing number of clients. Um, but outside of a, an initial, the initial linkage between the founder and, and, and the foundation, there was never any formal tie. But, and I mention this because I think it's relevant to, to some of the uh, issues we're struggling with now. The foundation, though, did, I think, extract a fairly strong ethic from, from the business side of, of its genesis. Um, I think the, that, that it relied on capital grant making seemed consistent with the sort of business uh, that 
was known for its retail presence in communities, uh, that it could be operated efficiently, appeal to Sebastian Kresge's frugal sensibilities, and he was sort of a classic turn of the century entrepreneur who wanted things to, keep, to be kept lean, and, and they have been at Kresge. And then it was relatively risk-free, and we all talk about this in a moment, um, really appealed to the founding board members who were drawn from the business community and who were used to that kind of relatively conservative business practice. But over time, and in recognition that these projects were very expensive, what evolved out of this emphasis on, on capital was the idea of issuing capital challenge grants. And I don't need to tell you what all that is about, but it essentially it provided organizations with deadline-driven incentives to leverage additional financial support that would help them kind of reach their ultimate goal of finishing the project. And the capital challenge grant program did ultimately become the central grant-making tool of the foundation, and it is today at least it was as of six months ago. Um, and for decades, it supported the construction of college campuses, large hospitals, major cultural institutions, and all sorts of anchoring institutions in a community. Um, and as the Challenge Grant Program increased in size and our scope of grant making expanded, um, its rationale shifted slightly from simply building buildings to building the capacity of organizations. And it was a fairly um, internally directed distinction, which I think most grantees to this day don't understand, but it, in the Kresge staff and the Kresge boardroom, there was a real sense that what we really were trying to do was sort of seize the transformational moment that is represented by an organization's capital campaign decision to build or expand, and to harness sort of the potential for a larger base of support um, through this campaign to raise private funds. So it was really about the, the, the transformational moment of that this represented in the life cycle of an organization. Um, as, as the foundation continued to grow over the years, the program spawned a number of special initiatives, uh, which were focused mostly on creating fundraising capacity in certain kinds of organizations, historically black colleges, community colleges. We worked with a select number of, sort of struggling human service organizations. But it was all with this notion of how can you make sure that you're raising the kind of money over time from the right kind of donors uh, to make sure that your operation is sustainable. Um, and my predecessor, John Marshall, who was really an extraordinary guy, I don't know if anyone in the room met him, but John uh, was at Kresge for over 20 years, and it is really his imprint on this work that is most powerful. Um, summed up the foundation's approach as follows. You know, he was a very plain spoken guy, and, and this is how he characterized it. He said, here at Kresge, we take the position that if you find a mechanism that strengthens an organization and find people that are eager to go through your application process and value your grant not as the be-all and end-all, but rather as a useful tool and a toolkit full of useful tools, you have a good chance of strengthening that organization and in the process strengthening the community or communities it was created to serve. Um, fairly straightforward, you know, is essentially the idea that um, that we are not going to sort of pick and choose winners, but that we're going to sort of look to the community to pick and choose their winners, and that, that the ability of an organization to gather the kind of fundraising that supports them to finish a capital campaign will be the indicator of that. And there are a number of very positive qualities about this approach. First and probably foremost, our brand was really clear. I think as I was talking to Bobby, I can't remember who mentioned uh, that as they were beginning their work in this field, it was. It was the case that Kresge is one of the very few national foundations who consistently invests and underwrites building projects. Uh, Kresge's demanding, rigorous, and professionalized application and approval process was really seen as carrying a good housekeeping seal of approval, so a, a credential that really attached um, a certain legitimacy to the organization's approach to fundraising. And we heard, we've heard that time and time again, and particularly for small emerging institutions. This was really an important, uh, an important uh, credential. Second, uh, Kresge has always seen itself as being neutral. Kresge didn't make judgment about the value of an organization's mission, its impact on the local community, or its role within a particular field of work. We left that to others, preferring instead to interpret an organization's ability to make progress on its capital campaign as evidence that the community value its work. Third, although we re remain consistent in our goals and methods, we were able to adapt this basic model to special circumstances. So we have transported our core capital work to a number of fields of interest. Uh, as I mentioned, we spent a lot of time with 
seven historically black colleges and universities trying to build out their development departments. Uh, we work with a number of community foundations, including the Southeast Michigan Community Foundation, which is now a $500 million foundation, to get them started and to, to, to push this model into the community foundation world. Uh, we've provided bonus grants to green building projects, and we've tried to professionalize the fundraising function in a small number of nonprofits in South Africa and Mexico. And fourth, we viewed ourselves as being highly accessible. Because Kresge permitted virtually anyone to apply, and because our grants were payable to almost any eligible entity that can satisfy our challenge requirements, uh, we are open to almost any form of nonprofit activity. And this accessibility was reinforced by our being available for so-called appointments, Brian and I were talking about this at lunch, in which the board chair, the executive, and the development director of any organization willing to go to the trouble could travel to Troy, Michigan, and spend an hour with our staff to talk about the organization's campaign. Come by, come back to why that doesn't exactly fit my model of accessibility, but it was, it was the model that they felt strongly about. So when you add all of this up, the sort of, I think, very decent and honorable tradition of Kresge, together with these very these four qualities that I think were in many ways very attractive to, to, to the family and to the, and to the board, the cumulative impact of Kresge uh, in, in its capital challenge grant model is, I think, unquestionably beneficial. It's a system that's helped countless campaigns reach the finish line. It's repeatedly generated new gifts, larger gifts, and more engaged trustees and executives. And it's helped organizations set new benchmarks against which to measure their development. So it's, it's all good stuff, uh, it seems to me. But as I was interviewing with the Kresge board for this job, I suggested that there was a, another way of viewing the work. And one was a, that was a little bit less favorable. And that alternative view was in large part shaped by scores of conversations I had with colleagues from throughout the country prior to my getting there. Their critique was really remarkable in its consistency, it, it, and its basic components struck me as both fair and compelling. Uh, and I, I, I hesitate a little bit to sort of go through these, but I think it, it's just really not possible to understand what we're trying to do at Crescent without being a little bit self-critical. I don't mean this in any way to denigrate this tradition that I've just described, but I think just to play back um, to you, as I did to the board, what I think others were saying and thinking about the way Kresge worked. The first critique was that Kresge's emphasis on the development function, the fundraising function, was far too thin a slice of what organizational capacity meant. Kresge has placed a heavy emphasis on the power of grants to build long-term organizational capacity by strengthening the machinery of fundraising. And in many cases, that's clearly come about. But in many others, the case is not at all clear. I mean, do we really believe, for example, that a Kresge Challenge Grant materially strengthens the institutional capacity of a well-resourced private university engaged in a billion-dollar endowment campaign driven by scores of development staff and a high-powered board? I don't think so. And I think we have lots of examples to show that we were just simply sort of one more checkoff on a an ambitious fundraising campaign. We were certainly not about the business of expanding capacity with those sorts of organizations. At perhaps an even more fundamental level, what is our empirical basis for believing that an expanded facility or an expanded donor base influences the quality of services an organization provides or the ability of an organization to sustain growth over time? Pretty basic question. If you're putting all your marbles on that proposition, you better have some empirical support for it. Uh, we had none. And how do you take into account the explosion of nonprofit mergers, venture philanthropy, and all of the other major shifts that are going on in the nonprofit marketplace? Clearly, significantly affecting the way charitable organizations raise private funds. And I would suggest, again, not at all. So, in, in essence, what Kresge, I think, has been doing is providing a substantial equity investment in nonprofit organizations without any sense of true return. We have simply looked at the proposition through the wrong end of the telescope. A building campaign is unquestionably a teachable moment in an organization's history. But it teaches us only about one dimension of a nonprofit's resilience and precious little about the relevance of its mission, the efficacy of its strategies, the efficiency of its operations, the adaptability of its staff to changes in the external environment, the quality of its governance, and the like. So the second critique was that Kresge had become trapped in a monoculture. 
Relying on a single tool is a striking limitation on the range of any foundation's ability to respond to complex social challenges, and in Kresge, it was particularly, particularly powerful. Our core capital challenge grant program exerts a very strong gravitational pull on our attempts to explore different ways of coming at organizational capacity building. Even when we have designed special initiatives, as I mentioned earlier, we haven't wanted those special initiatives to be so different from our core work as to spin out of that gravitational field. Any attempt, however brave, by our program staff to come up with ways that were less formulaic and more creative uh, was really a futile struggle against that gravitational uh, pull of the program's sun, the Capital Challenge Program. Or to shift the metaphor, it's a little bit like using a screwdriver for all your construction projects. You know, it works some of the time, um, but it really does limit what you ultimately can build. An alternative might be to decide what you want to build and then select the tools most appropriate to the task. Hammers and saws can be useful things. A third element of the critique is that Kresge has marginalized value judgments. The mission, the purposes, and the strategies of an organization have not, in the vast majority of cases coming before Kresge, been relevant to our consideration of a request. It's, I think that's actually quite shocking to most people. They can't imagine that you wouldn't ask what, a family, what an organization does, or why it does it, or how it does it. But we don't. You fit our formula for a successful campaign, or you don't. Check off the boxes. You have to be halfway through the campaign. You have to have lined up your lead gifts. You have to have charted out with precision how you're going to use Kresge money to enlist individual donors, and the like. It's, it's really an accounting exercise, not an exercise in creative judgment. You can imagine how frustrating it is for staff or a board for that matter, but staff particularly, to execute on an algorithm. Recommending funding for a well-structured campaign of only the narrowest importance, and declining projects with considerable pro uh, prospect for substantial impact that they contain an element of risk in their soul, and as a result are unacceptable. A fourth problem is that Kresge fails to put requests into any context. Focusing inwardly on an organization's adherence to a fundraising formula prevents any consideration of the broader context within which the organization is working. I don't have to tell you, but every field of nonprofit work is changing with dizzying speed. There's an arms race in hospital construction and an emerging energy surrounding community-based health care. Uh, so too in colleges and universities, obviously, which are erecting recreation complexes, campus centers, dorms, and other amenities to attain advantage in competition for more students. Social service agencies are being buffeted as structures of public support build up over generations are being dismantled in the name of tax relief and nonprofit accountability. Arts campaigns are increasingly vehicles for community revitalization and pride. New models of housing, economic development, and community building are splashing across America as waves of new immigrants move through our cities and rural areas. The Foundation's grant making simply has not been set up to take any of this into account. For our purposes, health care is the same as higher education, is the same as human services, is the same as the arts. We parachute in on a capital campaign asking only whether enough individual donors will step forward to complete the project. The absence of contextual analysis, too, both creates and reflects the predisposition of our staff to remain generalists. The staff has had no reason to develop detailed knowledge of the field, which in turn limits our contribution, uh, the contribution we might make as an institution to that field or to the broader conversations of importance to the sector. A fifth problem is that we're risk averse. Um, remember uh, Russ Ewald, my, one of my predecessors at McKnight, once told me a story about a prospective grantee who came to talk to him. Uh, she was proud that her community development organization had not had a single failure, not a single failure, in almost three years of running the home ownership program. They say, did anyone here know Russ? Did you know Russ, Joel? Uh, big, hair of a man, uh, heart of gold, but he was tough. And uh, Russ thanked her for her time and uh, told her that McKnight simply wouldn't be able to fund her organization. She was just dumb. She, you know, she argued that they were a model of diligence and, and care. And, Perhaps Russ replied, but we're not a bank, and we would prefer that our grantees take some risks. Well, Presky has even less risk tolerance than a bank. Uh, we have funded only those who appeared virtually certain to succeed, and then only when they did succeed. There is no risk. Zip. Um, and matter of fact, we actually have an IRS ruling that permits us to bank our grants when they are made, rather uh, when they are committed. 
rather than run the arcade because our certainty of, of payment is so high. We're the only foundation in the country that has that really. And because of that orientation, uh, our internal systems have, have ossified. It, it's hard to overstate how, um, in, in, well, it's hard to overstate how ponderous, how bureaucratic, how finicky, and how rigid our internal machinery was. The staff's role was to assess a request against the proper components of a model fundraising plan and a monitor progress toward that goal. Uh, the result was predictable. You had triple and quadruple redundancies to make sure that no mistake was ever made. You had an organizational structure, sort of like a Rube Goldberg drawing, where responsibilities were diffuse and lines of accountability were hopelessly fragmented and pointing in all sorts of different directions. And there was a premium on anonymity and, and an aversion to the innovative, independent gesture. One staff person I remember uh, termed it for me a culture of resistance. Uh, I mention this not to, again, be disrespectful or to self flagellate, but to, ex to suggest the extent to which the grant making machinery not only reflected the program, but in turn made change very difficult. And sixth and finally, uh, was that Kresge was almost completely absent from the national philanthropic stage. And we're a $3.3 billion foundation. And that's approximately the size of Rockefeller. I think it's larger than Carnegie. We make grants in every state of the union. And yet the narrowness of our approach has limited our ability to lead, to discover, and to learn within the national philanthropic environment. President of one of the nation's largest foundations, it was not Adi, probably could have been, uh, remarked to me that Kresge's approach struck him, as, struck him as so indiscriminate and broad that he was concerned that we added little to philanthropy but a leverage technique. And that leverage technique was 20 years old. National foundations don't believe that Kresge has much to teach them, nor do they perceive that we would be particularly open to learning from them. These kinds of attitudes isolate us and make it difficult to be taken seriously as a potential partner. So, there you have it. Um, a very serious-minded tradition of helping nonprofits grow, clouded increasingly, in my view, by an emerging recognition of serious deficiencies in our ambition and our tactics. So the question was, how do you depreciate the asset? How do you determine what aspects of our past work continue to have value and should be carried forward, and what aspects no longer serve us so well and should be discarded? But asking that in the context of a foundation very proud of its connection to a fine family, with that family still represented on the board was a bit dicey. You want to do what with your grandmother's china? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> All that build up for one. <laughs> but it really was true. You had the sense that you were really mucking around and covered, and uh, this was uh, um, dicey stuff. So we really couldn't start from scratch. You couldn't throw away the entire tea set, but you could go back to some first principles. So I suggested to the board that there might be four characteristics, four characteristic values of privately endowed philanthropy that might serve as a point of departure for our conversations. I have to uh, offer apologies to Paul Hildesacher, the extraordinary philanthropist, a philanthropoid, yeah, as Joel calls him, an educator, because I essentially stole these ideas from him. But let me at least use this third section just to briefly talk about each one of those qualities and their reasonable things. First is the ability to see things whole. You know, it's so easy in philanthropy to become focused on a particular grant or an immediate need that we sometimes forget the enormous privilege we're accorded to see the big picture. We have the opportunity to take our bearings from the more distant horizon line and to stretch out the connections, and to search out the connections among ostensibly unrelated activities. Now there's always the risk in doing that that you'll succumb to the philanthropic malaise of being too ponderous and slow. And yet, there's a positive side to that deliberateness and, and judiciousness. It enables us to be persistent and consistent and pursue methodically over time and across a wide spectrum of issues. Looking at the larger picture I suggested to the board might take any number of forms at Presby. We might cultivate a little bit more systematically than we have the kind of patient intelligence that permits us to go deeply and intensively into an issue or issues over a long period of time. We might try to play a more direct role in shaping developments within a particular field, stitching together threads of common interest among the public, the private, the nonprofit, and the philanthropic sectors. And we might seek to develop the kind of expertise that would permit us to partner meaningfully with others in collectively confronting challenge beyond the scope of a single institution's ability to take on. 
The second broad quality is the opportunity to use the full range of tools at our disposal. You know, I've read we in philanthropy in France, but that is obviously not the only role we can play. Uh, we can convene people as a way of forging relationships and promoting joint, joint inquiry, fostering concerted action. We can use strategic communications to deepen our understanding of and our engagement in the work of our grantees. We can invest in research to capitalize on the community's intellectual power and make an enduring knowledge base available to others. We can encourage networks to serve as intellectual extension cords, amplifying the power of organizations working in shared purpose. Kresge has shied from moving too far from the safe harbor of capital grant making. It's the monoculture problem I talked about. And at some level, that's completely understandable. But different tools do exist, depending on what we want to accomplish, and we should add those to our tool lives. A third characteristic is the freedom to take risks. Private philanthropy, secured by its asset and freed of the need to run for re-election or disclose quarterly profits, does have the independence to take bets. Philanthropy is, in essence, society's social venture capital. But in the main, in the main at Kresge, we've been reluctant to play that role. And yet, even if you were to take our most conservative constraints and conventions, we could increase our risk tolerance. We could do that by placing small bits on individual requests where the certainty of success is simply not there, but where we feel pretty good about the value of what an organization is trying to accomplish. You could take medium-sized bits on grantees who have the need for capital but who aren't in the middle of a capital campaign, extending planning money, providing working capital, or supporting, supporting human capital needs such as leadership development. And we could entertain larger bets on ideas and projects that address the most nettlesome contemporary challenges, but that promise returns commensurate with the risk of the Detroit issue. The fourth quality is the latitude to invest in underrepresented people and causes. Philanthropy in its various forms, individuals, donor advised funds, corporate foundations, the whole ball of wax, provides an array of support for society's full spectrum of nonprofit organizations, cultural, environmental, health, educational, and the like. Individuals pick and choose based on their endlessly varied personal beliefs and passions. Corporate foundations often invest through their cause marketing line, and causes that really tie back to their product line. And family foundations play a little bit like Thanksgiving Day dinner table with priors scattering along fault lines. But the case can be made that privately endowed foundations with large asset bases and highly professional staff should play a different role. They, we, uh, have the ability to help level the playing field for those in need. You can't do that by giving grants to individuals. The law doesn't permit us to do that. But we can do it by funding organizations that, in effect, serve as our society's moral thermostat flipping into the on position in the presence of suffering, injustice, or inequality. Kresge has, to be sure, a proud tradition of supporting many of these kinds of organizations. But this support is not the result of our intentionally singling out these organizations. Instead, it is a consequence of their having met our fundraising requirements. There is an opportunity to, for Kresge to stand in a different, more deliberate relationship to these organizations by ele elevating within our value structure the importance of the amelioration of suffering, enhancing opportunity, or assisting those that have been marginalized, who have been marginalized by society. So those four qualities, and I know they're quite basic, suggested the desirability of constructing a program framework at Kresge that gives a rise to an approach that over time is more contextual, employs a greater variety of tools, and takes on greater risks, and acknowledges the importance of advancing opportunity. So what I wanted to do is um, take just a, a couple of minutes and show you what we're thinking about. And I'll be uh, a little less scripted from here on out, probably to a disastrous effect. <laughs> Let me just work off of this.
you tell where I'm going with this? Um, in the box. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is a box. It, it is in purple. There is something, there is something attractive about it. But when you start with the Capital Challenge Program, this is the grandmother's kind of problem. We clearly are going to continue to make capital grants. They're very important, and uh, I think really do sort of anchor us in the family tradition. They anchor us in what we're competent at. They anchor us in lots of things. But one of the things that we've learned as we uh, talk to grantees is that let's just take, take the, uh, the thought that once you're done with the capital challenge, or with a uh, capital challenge, and, and you finished your building, then what? I mean, I can't tell you how many organizations have come to us and said, well, that's great, we have the building, but now how do we build endowment? How do we sustain operations? How do we do leadership development? How do we, over time, increase the efficacy of, of our governance structures? All of those sorts of things. And those, those were fairly straightforward, that kind of post-campaign stretch makes sense. And then we also heard that there would be all sorts of things to be said for entering campaigns earlier. As I mentioned earlier, wouldn't it be nice to take a couple of these higher risk capital campaigns at an earlier stage? I mean, maybe rather than getting all your lead donors in the box, maybe Kresge's good housekeeping seal could be important to you to get some of those lead donors in the box, particularly for smaller community-based organizations without sophisticated development staff. Um, and how that assistance uh, occurred could vary. I mean, maybe we could do some training with development officers. Maybe it's not always high buck um, capital infusions. Working capital, I think, we can talk more about this, I think is a huge um, uh, topic on the horizon line of, of nonprofit capitalization. I think you have a nonprofit finance fund, you have lots of organizations across the country trying to think more carefully about what does a business plan for a nonprofit organization look like? Where does working capital, flexible capital um, uh, get drawn in? And then at the very front end, maybe it would just simply be useful for some of these organizations to be able to plan. Should we do a capital campaign? Is there other kinds of capital structures that might be uh, useful? And so this idea of stretching the notion of a capital challenge program, um, both to earlier and later and in different forms, really suggests that what this sort of first tier of work might look like at Crescu really has much more to do with capital, the capitalization of nonprofits than it does with the capital challenge program. So again, the box remains. We're not going to throw out the TSA. But we are going to think a little bit more about what it will take over time for nonprofits to capitalize in a different kind of way. So that's step one. If that's all we did, um, I, I think that would have been useful. Um, but it doesn't really fully address those four values that I talked about. So you gotta take it a step further. And the first piece is to sort of think about this values question. Um, if, if you think about advancing low income opportunity, uh, having a greater impact on the community through a capital project, um, enhancing ecological sustainability through green features or through siting or through any number of other things, by promoting interdisciplinary work, collaboration. There are all sorts of ways that you could imagine taking a look at this range of possibilities, because this is still the entire nonprofit field. We haven't narrowed at all, right? And so the idea is that one way of beginning to narrow is to talk about what values are most important in Kresge and essentially create a weighting system. So if Harvard Medical School wants to come in for a capital challenge grant, which they did and we gave them, even though they're now seven times ours, <laughs> um, um, they can still come in, but a hospice in San Antonio might also come in, and some of these values might begin to tilt forward. So this is not a screen so much as it is a waiting, a waiting process. Similarly, I think this whole notion of context is terribly important, that somehow trying to understand what is different in the human services field with its structures of public support from uh, cultural fields and hospital fields, we just, we just got to figure out somehow to differentiate among these fields. It makes no sense to treat, treat hospitals with all of their complex financing mechanisms the same way you would deal with Guthrie Theater. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a different proposition. So this whole first tier is both a stretch and a filter. I mean, it's, it's trying to get at the broader spectrum of need as well as imposing some of our judgment on the question how well we do that, what our standards are, how we articulate all of these standards, details. Um, the, um, 
The second idea, though, is that this is really about organization by organization grant making, traditional grant making. Nothing wrong with it. We will continue to do it. It will be the foundational work at, at present. But increasingly, what I'd like to do is build out from some of the things that we've already done, green buildings, higher education, some international work, and try to understand whether there aren't fields of interest that are important in, uh, for us to become engaged in because of uh, board passion, staff passion, or just ultimate importance. Selecting a field is not, is not the end of the proposition, to be sure. Um, you got to figure out what it is in that field you're going to be interested in. But I think that that is sort of the exercise we're going, we're going through. And what, what ultimately happens as you move from organization by organization support to sort of field building is that you begin implicating more and more of the tools I've talked about. So here's this notion of multiple tools kicking in. It's hard to convene around this. It's hard to create networks around this. You can't invest in intermediaries down here. But I think as you move into broader fields, sort of the more national aspect of what Kresge does, these ideas, the ideas of creating an empirical base for your work, um, convening networks, intermediaries, strategic communications, those things become much more relevant and really do that, end up having the effect of expanding the toolbox that I talked about earlier. And for us, the, sort of the key question is not only, you know, should we just simply build out a couple of these traditional um, <coughs> baskets of work uh, that we've been involved with, but what are the other baskets and why? And the question here is, where do we add value? And that's, that's really the key question. So what we have done is set up working teams. We have a fairly small staff, but we have uh, working teams in education, the arts, health, community development, a number of others. And, and we're asking them essentially to sort of almost do a blank sheet exercise. What could Kresge do that would be beneficial to the field? So we're out talking to Robert Wood Johnson about what how they made their choices in healthcare. What are they doing? Where do they see the gaps? We're talking to Annie Casey about their community development work. Where, where might we fit there? Um, on and on. It's, a, it's, a, it's an intensive process for the small staff. It's very time consuming. At the same time, they're trying to churn out grants. And we can talk more about it. But it's, it's I think, a process of really trying to figure out where it is in the sort of field building realm we think we could be useful. Whoops, sorry. And finally, so if this is organization by organization, sort of tier, the first tier of your work, second tier of your work is advancing fields, the third tier is really strengthening places. And for us, that means Detroit. Uh, we, we have a national board, a number of whom feel that Detroit should just be the starting point for a broader community development agenda where we're trying to look for distressed communities where there have been disinvestment patterns. Uh, my sense is that Detroit should keep us busy for a while. Um, we are essentially the, the host foundation in Detroit. Kellogg kind of works there, um, spurred a little bit by the Michigan Attorney General Ford, works a little bit there. Um, but, um, but by and large, the foundations that work in Detroit are very fine foundations, but they're much smaller. And Presky has the potential to be, I think, uh, an important player. For the last 10 years, we have had a Detroit program where we have a Detroit initiative where we've done essentially capital grant making in Detroit. And it's some, some really good work, actually. It, it is, I think, an example of where this model actually can, can pay real benefit. I think the best example is, for those of you who've been to Detroit, the riverfront for years and years has become sort of the back door of Detroit. It's been woefully neglected. And in the last three or four years, it has been transformed. It is extraordinary. That was done through a, largely through a Presby $50 million challenge grant. We got General Motors and Ford and Kellogg and a bunch of other people into the game through this challenge mechanism. It was very effective and very smart. And as a result, we have now almost $240 million invested just from philanthropy um, on the riverfront and another however much, many hundreds of million dollars in, in private markets moving on to the riverfront. But having said that, this has got to be more than an initiative. It's got to be long term. We've got to put our roots down deep. We've got to work comprehensively. We've got to think about program support, operating support. We've got to think about grassroots. You've got to think about high level policy. You've got to think about the mezzo level. There are all sorts of things. This is a very complicated place based work, which has come way, way different from what Presby has done in the past. And, and I think very exciting. And I think here, this third year of work, 
the possibility of partnerships working with other foundations um, is extraordinary. We essentially laid out some initial, initial thinking to the other foundations in Detroit about a week ago and essentially said, you tell us. The Skillman Foundation is working on educational reform. Tell us what the three or four things we could do with the install. If the McGregor Fund is working on homelessness and housing, tell us what the two or three things we could do with the install. Well, it's really, a, and in many ways, an enviable position to be able to sort of say, what is it that we can do that would be ultimately about partnership? So this, I, I call it, for, sorry for lack of a better name, call this tears and basket, incremental increase in your tools and the baskets become, become a suggestion of a focus, strategic focus. And so uh, that is sort of the, the broad frame we're working with. Um, let me take 30 seconds, and it will just be 30 seconds, um, just suggesting that um, this has been hard. This is uh, <laughs> seven months, and the operational implications of this have sort of been ricocheting in all directions. Um, first, it's deeply troubling. <laughs> I can't tell you. I can't tell you how many calls I've got. It's deeply troubling to a wide swath of institutions that have looked at Kresge much the way others look at an ATM machine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, institutions have figured this out. They have figured this out. We just turned down a very well-regarded small private liberal arts college in the Midwest that has had six Kresge Challenge Grants. I keep asking our staff, if, we, if the purpose of the Challenge Grant is to build capacity why is it taking us seven times to get it right? <laughs> um, you know, and they were just shocked. It was like the Rusty Wall question. You know, what did we do wrong? No. Um, so the problem is, is that when you have one foot in the old world and one foot in the new world, managing these kinds of expectations is difficult. And so we've got to think really long and hard about how to communicate. When are we ready to communicate? How do we do it? Second, um, as I suggested in my remarks about our staffing, it's going to drive a very different staff dynamic and organizational culture, and the birth of which has, I think, begun, but is, is tough. Um, you, know, you can design programs till you're doing the face, but if you don't have the delivery machinery, uh, it's not going to take hold. And so we're spending a lot of time internally now that we've sort of got the frame uh, and the, the boards buy into the frame um, in place. And third, uh, and this is sort of a narrow point, but I think it's an interesting one is that it has huge implications for the board's role. I think this is a really interesting case study in the making of board governance because if what you're doing is this, if you're a board member, what am I asking you to do? You know, you've had a staff that has been these applications every which way, up and down, sideways. What if Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia University, is on our board? What am I asking Lee to do? Second guess, you know, the, uh, the number crunching. So it was, I actually think it was, it was we have sort of averted crisis because we've got this extraordinary board. I mean, they're really good. I mean, they're just top rate. And I, I have taken the view that with all due respect, you can't keep a board interested in that very long. And so the possibility of having the board help shape this stuff without micromanaging your direction is very interesting. I'm hoping that increasingly what will happen is that they'll sort of, they'll come in at the sort of the policy level. You know, are we stretching the right way? Are we comfortable? Um, doing the kinds of capitalization gestures that we might have in mind. Have we chosen the right fields and the right focus within the fields? And what the devil are we doing in Detroit anyway? So um, I think I think those are sort of the three operational implications that I sort of see as front and center. So with that, I will stop. That's Talk a little bit in the way you did this morning 
about the kinds of things you've done already and, and where you see that going in terms of building the kind of consensus and cooperative arrangements there that are going to make it possible for you to do what you want to do. One of, the, one of the problems in Detroit time is that um, I think the sectors are um, deeply distrustful of one another. Uh, I think there, there has been a long tradition of, of patronage and incompetence in the public sector, despite some good individuals. Um, there is just no sense that the public sector can deliver services efficiently or that it will be well run. Um, the private sector has traditionally been dominated by the autos, which are seen as very elitist, and they pull most of their operation out of the center city, with the exception of GM anyway. Um, the nonprofit sector is very weak in Detroit. Uh, um, it's one of the, the real surprises, Joel, coming from Minneapolis, is how fragile the nonprofit sector is in Detroit. There just aren't very many really strong organizations. There are a few, but they tend to be mega organizations, and then very small ones that are doing God's work. And the philanthropic community has not had a tradition of making the bold gesture. The Community Foundation, I think, is, is getting there. They're very cautious. They have, I'm stunned to find out, the $500 million Community Foundation has $1.2 million of discretionary money each year. That's extraordinary. Everything else is tied up with donor funds, which is fine. I mean, those donor funds are doing good work, but the ability for them to range and, and push and pull and is, is very difficult. And so I think, you know, I mentioned to, to the class this morning that one of the great concerns I have leaving Minneapolis is here. I've been in Minneapolis 50 years. I kind of know who to pick up the phone and talk to. I know the mayor. I know this. I know that. And it, you know, so all of my inadequacies kind of get papered over by my ability to call smart people. And I can't do that in Detroit um, quite the same way. And so what we've done is just, in some ways, sort of started from scratch and have tried to go out and try to build within each sector a set of initiatives that sort of links Kresge to their future. So with the private sector, it is this river walk and the revitalization of the downtown. We're working with a guy named Roger Penske, most people know, autos, Penske, oil, and all of that. Uh, he has sort of single-handedly taken over efforts to try to clean up the downtown. So we have work with an organization he's begun to help provide some support for that and to link it to, to job training of, of the lowest income communities in Detroit. Um, we've tried to uh, go into the nonprofit sector, sort of sector by sector, and try to figure out ways in which we can convince them that a movement away from capital challenge grant making uh, might be useful to them and to sort of solicit ideas from them about how that would add up. And the public sector, uh, is, is always a tough nut to crack, but I've just, um, I've just felt that cultivating the leadership in City Hall is ultimately really important, even though these election cycles turn. And so I've spent a lot of time with Mayor Kilpatrick and uh, just trying to build some relationships, trying to build some trust, and encouraging him, maybe I could back up just a moment. This is, some of you may know, Kiwami Kilpatrick is the, the son of a U.S. Congresswoman, and so a long political family, but he was a um, two-time All-American at Florida State University, big tackle, he's about 6'4", 240, big imposing guy, earring, um, rapper, I mean just, and he was elected mayor of a city of 900,000 people at the age of 31. Mm -hmm. And so this is a guy who had just a disastrous first term. I mean, he just did everything wrong, American do wrong. I mean, he had cronies, he had his privilege, he just wasn't ready. He just wasn't ready. And to his enormous credit, and I would really urge that you all watch this guy, he is going to become one of the two or three best mayors in America. He is smart, he is tough, he has completely learned from his first years of, of misfortune. And he is smart as a whip. He reminds me a lot of Bill Clinton. He just has a sponge memory. He's incredibly, um, incredibly um, compelling on the stump. Great with kids. I mean, it, it, lots of ingredients. And so, my sense is that if if a foundation can do anything, it is to provide cover for a mayor like this. We can't begin to to give him the kinds of resources he needs to keep his parks open or to provide you know sanitary pickup every Thursday. I mean, we can't do the basic stuff. 
but we can single out a handful of initiatives that are really important to him where having some political um, air cover will really be helpful. And so he's, he's taken the step of singling out six Detroit neighborhoods out of I don't know, 60 to focus his attention on. And it's, a, I think, an act of real political courage because you can imagine everyone saying, well, how about me? And does that mean you're turning your back on this? And turning back on that? But he sort of stuck to his guns. And I think that that becomes an opening for Kresge to say, okay, why don't we um, go in and, and help you really drill down on those six neighborhoods, try to pull together some of the issues. And what I, I'd be interested, we're, we're working with the National Consortium of Foundations and Banks to get them all to come to Detroit in the spring, Harvard with Johnson, Ford, Gates, the whole crew, to talk about what are we all doing in Detroit? How can we line it up? How, how can we begin stacking it up and aligning the work? How can we, in, in effect, help give the mayor some impetus to move forward? Um, and so I think, I think that sort of selective engagement with each of the sectors is important. And then I think we need a couple of large gestures that signal that we're breaking out of the purple box. Um, and so one, um, one is, uh, just because it's, no one else is doing it, is that we're going to start, we're going to launch a mental Detroit arts program. Um, in addition to providing for the capital needs of the Art Institute and, and helping the opera building the building, um, I, we're going to try to figure out a sort of a top to bottom approach that's, you know, five or six million dollars a year that um, involves artist fellowship and a handful of disciplines. Um, provides operating support to large, medium-sized, and, and grassroots organizations, and helps begin underwriting some of the infrastructure of emerging collaboration in program development, audience development, and it's, it's a small gesture, but I think it represents sort of one of those clear breakout moments. And at the same time, we're working uh, with Ford, and Kellogg, and Knight, and the local foundations to create a very large, the largest of its kind, um, fund to help with the retooling of the southeastern Michigan economy. I'm not sure if anyone can do this right, and I've been kind of a stickler on it, but the idea of creating a $100 million fund with a bunch of national foundations and local foundations working together to try to figure out whether there aren't two or three leverage points that would ultimately help the economy of southeastern Michigan turn this corner. Um, is an intriguing challenge. It may be that you just can't do it. Foundations alone or with private? With private, with private sector engagement. Yeah, I'm mean, sort of really short on that. There's a, there's a business organization called Detroit Renaissance that is essentially generating a lot of ideas about how to do this. And I think what this becomes is sort of the capitalization of some of that work. So yeah, it's both working off the air effort and then trying to draw in some of the, the private sector. So I think that you know, engaging with each of the sectors, trying to do a couple of breakout pieces of work that signal a different intention may, may be the way to get started. Well, I was going to ask you a question that you may have answered uh, in response to Joel's question, but in especially the references that work in there, but I wanted to show you. What I was going to ask you was, how do you make certain that your grants may be employed is informed by a representative force of the community? Now, you talked about, in effect, your communication with leadership, uh, and perhaps they they represent. But I, I realize this community is from diversity. It's obviously, community is a population quite different from Minneapolis, uh, and, and a history but because of that is very different. How do you know that you are? Uh, I've seen uh, public school buildings where there were they were not river fronts, but were world class computer mm -hmm. operations which had to be protected from the rain coming in through the roof. Mm -hmm. So there was something wrong there about the priority, uh, it seemed to me, in taking care of children. Uh, do you know that you know, how do you know that what's the priorities in Detroit ought to be? The mayor told you? Uh, you know, we'd be in deep trouble if that, if that were our only source of information. I completely agree with you. Um, it's a really complicated Question. And, and I think you can only sort of by, by layering out three or four responses. I mean, one is I think you do have to go with political leadership to some extent. There is no one else, it seems to me, who is able to sort of take the larger view and, and to try to create the connections. 
And that's why I think the quality of this guy makes a difference. But this, we're just um, rolling down. Um, yeah, I just think this would not be, not be a viable strategy. So, that, so I do think that there is sort of some, some higher level macro intelligence that you just have got here. And I think at the, at the MENSO level, these, the foundations that are working in Detroit are intensely community focused. So the Skillman Foundation has for the last two years been out in the community, every night, community meetings, community visioning, community planning. So I think at least at the front end, until our staff gets a little bit more up to speed, I think relying on the foundation community is work and trying to, again, enhance or accelerate or deepen or do something their work is useful. But I, I think you're right. Over time, there is no substitute for just getting out of the community. And that's why this notion of these appointments is so annoying. I mean, this idea of having people come out to Troy, Michigan. Troy is 20 miles north of Detroit. I mean, it's in an office industrial complex in the middle of one of these northern suburbs. I mean, you know, they're it's sort of the sense of remove, the sense of the elitism of sitting out in that community and, and never getting into any community to say nothing in Detroit, I think it's just intolerable. And so I think part of part of our challenge is to get site visits on the radar, particularly in Detroit. We'll have to figure out how to do this across the country. That's hard to you know, have so much depth. But we, we certainly can make sure that we do site visits for every grant that we make in Detroit and we will. And so I think just but I think that'll take time. Um, and then I think just trying to figure out some way to truly be accessible. I mean, rather than sort of putting the stamp on our process is accessible, as I mentioned earlier, I think we can truly be accessible and invite people to come in and challenge. And, and that's just not been part of our culture. How do you do that? It's hard. But I think if the advantage of being in a place is that you can do that, I think, more readily than a national foundation can. That's what has trouble really getting its roots deep. I thought about moving the foundation headquarters to the Detroit. Did you tell him to say that? <laughs> he didn't tell me that his natural follow-on. <laughs> so I don't feel like he's meddling now. No, I, uh, well, is this is going on your website to all the trustees. Um, I would do it in a heartbeat. It was the worst decision Kresge has made in the last five years, but in fact they made it. About four years ago, they were trying to figure out whether they should they needed expansion space, so whether they should tear the old building down, it, it, for those of you who don't, there's no reason to know. It, it's, it's a, part of it is an old farmhouse. It's an old farmhouse. It's an 1860s farmstead in the middle of this crazy industrial park. Um, and so there was a certain sentimental, it had nothing to do with the Kreskis, but it, it, it had a certain sentimental appeal. And so there was one wing of the board that wanted to stay put and renovate the farmhouse. And there was another wing of the board that just said, no, this is our time. And this is about three years ago. This is our time to make a statement. Let's go downtown and you know, use all the advantages we can to help Detroit get, get some traction. Uh, it was very divisive. And they ended up choosing to stay on site and work, uh, uh, with this incredible facility. It's a platinum lead building. It's, it's off the charts. It's lovely. It's a glorious work environment. But we just moved in a year ago. And so I just think, as, as outrageous as I am with all of this, I, I don't think I could, I could move our facilities. I think that would be too bad. But I think we can have field offices. I think we can do site visits. I think we can do other things. Rich? I'd like to ask a, a provocative question, which is along the general lines of, is that okay? Yeah, I, I, I thought you were just following my provocative question. Another provocative question. Another provocative question. Another provocative question. Uh, I think you'll see this one's possibly more incendiary. <laughs> uh, it's, it's along the general lines of, of um, what's wrong with being an ATM for the 501c3 organizations that uh, seek your support. Um, I, I, I've been struck many times by the fact that uh, the, the sort of kind of things that foundations most like to do and the needs that are perceived by the group that constitute the grantees often uh, hit like this. Uh, maybe, maybe they intersect a little bit. but. You know, if I'm a law school dean, what is it I want? Well, I, I, you know, we need to expand our library. We need to get more computers in our computer lab. We need to uh, expand the serials budget because uh, journals are now costing more and more. We need endowment funds for uh, shared uh, professorships. 
those are the things we need. And I have to say, I share some of the distress that you described at the end uh, from your existing grantees that one of the very few foundations that might plausibly have funded some of those things without my having to, uh, as the dean, kind of manipulate them into uh, 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 clothing that they are not uh, naturally comfortable in was the Kresge Foundation. And now it proposes to do some of that, but uh, to, any, to, to the degree you spend uh, a nickel on things that aren't what you've traditionally done, you're sort of uh, diminishing the resources that were available uh, to meet the things that I uh, felt the most need of. And, I guess it, it strikes me, and this is the, the really provocative uh, part, I guess, it strikes me that there's a little bit of a conflict of interest here. Foundations kind of want to do things that are interesting and different, and they want to maximize their own uh, influence over the world um, by, by uh, you know, seeing an array of, of proposals from uh, potential grantees and saying, that looks interesting, I'd like to have our name associated with that one. Uh, this looks interesting, I think I'd like to have our name associated with that one. And in order to maximize the leverage so that you can fund as many of these ideas as possible, you typically don't want to fund them in perpetuity. You want to fund them for a little while and get them off the ground, and then you hope that they'll take flight on their own so that you can move on to the next thing. But those are, you know, again, as I say, what I'd like as a, a law school dean would be for some um, reasonably well-endowed foundation to adopt my institution, just make it uh, their child, and uh, uh, provide for it in the ways that, uh, that any parent would provide for a child, uh, and, and uh, not have to figure out angles that can excite uh, a grant officer uh, at, uh, at a foundation. Let me be provocative, Pat, no matter how well you dress up your application, I can just give up. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I, I say that not to be insulting. But I think what, what this is is more about the about more than what it is. Because I think you're absolutely right. That's just intelligent. I mean, the minute grantees have got to kind of angle and try to figure you out. But in fact, that's exactly what's happening with Crespi. There was just a piece in the Wall Street Journal about Albion College and how it, it counts its uh, graduates as participating in their giving rates. And they quoted Kresge as the, one of the organizations that had been had by this, by this device. And I think, you know, I've talked to countless people in development who have said, well, we've sort of figured out your formula. It's pretty easy once you figure it out, how to, how to position it. My, I, I don't mean to be an institution, I mean. Well, I'm not a law school dean, so I'm yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 not getting a grant, it's okay yeah. with me. <laughs> because I think, I think what I'm trying to do, what I'm, what we're trying to do is to say, you know, right now, I would guess that 95% of all nonprofits in America wouldn't even think about applying to Christmas. They can't meet our requirements, they can't suffer the process, they, it's too complicated, they can't endure the endless cycles. I mean, it's just, it's really hard. And so what we end up doing is, I think, funding the best endowed institutions in the country. And we often do it over and over and over. And so I think it's not so much what we find interesting as trying to understand what we find important. And you're right, there's an element of arrogance to that and a presumptiveness, presumptuousness about that. But I think ultimately, these are scarce dollars. I mean, if it's you know, $150 million of, of money on the street each year is a big amount of money, but it's almost no money. And so not being able to make some value judgments about Harvard Medical School and the hospice in San Diego, I think really is critical. And that's why I, I said what I did about the law school. I think it's very hard for me to imagine that any reputable law school in this country can't ultimately meet their fundraising requirements through individual donors. And so what I'm looking for is whether there isn't a niche that is unique to privately endowed philanthropy where we don't see other sectors moving. Um, uh, you know, the, as we've looked at, at, at capital campaigns over the last couple of cycles since I've been there, we inevitably are convinced that the donor base of almost all of these will deliver the project. And so the question is, what then is Cresby doing? We're helping, sure. And we, you know, you're right, almost anyone would love to be adopted by, um, by a large foundation. But are we really materially advancing anything? And that's why we moved into not just buildings, but building capacity. But it, well, if we're not building capacity, we're not with any law school or medical school in this country. What are we doing? I mean, it, it's just a, it's just another source of money. And so, it may just be, I don't, you know, it, 
it may just be a, a difference in philosophy. I think we can't be kind of fickle. We can't sort of require people to jump through hoops just to make us feel like we're doing interesting work. But I think there is some place between that extreme and what Kresge represents that is useful. And I think that the notion of trying to figure out where we add value, how we can add value, and how we can do that in the context of what other, other people are and aren't doing, I think is the challenge we have. I'm not sure that answers your question. Well, a statement. Uh, in a world of wash with money, almost all of it going after the same objective, seeking to endorse that which has already been endorsed in the foundation world and the non-profit world, the one thing that's not necessary is a foundation which is yet another one of those endorsing the already endorsed, providing support for that which is already sanctified by money. What is the most necessary thing which he's proved repeatedly is not a fickle a dancing around looking for instant sex, but in fact a sustained commitment to a relationship which may change something fundamental. It's the way he did it at that night and what he's trying to do right here at, uh, at Kresge. I mean, to me the most absurd notions I ever knew was that we were doing a great thing for a community by building a building. Because then the questions really begin. What's happening inside the building? Who is it that's getting to use it? Does this now still serve the same 10% in Miami it always served, and now it's just a palace that's bigger for the same 10%? I mean, if you don't, if foundations don't get away from that, then we are, of course, just another Gilded Age group of Gilded Age givers. Yeah, I mean, so, get to it, son. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Chris. So, um, 15 years ago. He agrees. <laughs> no, I, I just, but I, I just want to make clear yeah. what they did with McKnight in that area was long-term and very systemic and systematic work, not jumping at every little sniff that came along and trying very hard to make change. Kristen? So, 15 years ago, I was a newspaper reporter for the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Oh, LA riots happened, and I was dispatched to Detroit to write a story on the 25th anniversary of the Detroit riots about um, um, sort of how the nonprofit sector and foundations had come together in 1967, pledging to rebuild Detroit and you know solve these underlying problems and these structural issues. And I spent a week there and talked to all the local foundations and all the community activists and the political people. And, and it was a really, really interesting experience. It was one of my favorite stories that I did. Um, and so it, it, what I hear you saying is very much, and I don't know all the details yet, but very much what I heard from mm -hmm. um, Skillman and McGregor and you know, lots of other foundations, mm -hmm. uh, Hudson, I think. Yeah, that's um, another. And um, at the time, and, and basically the story was kind of a depressing one, that you know, they had all these grand plans, they had the Detroit, they had you know, lots of money, they had this political opportunity, and it, it was, philanthropy was, and the nonprofit sector was just sort of powerless um, in the face of these massive demographic and economic dislocations. Yeah. So my question to you is twofold. One is, to what extent are you looking at your own history in Detroit of sort of prior efforts to rebuild Detroit? Um, and two, are, you, are there other models around the country of successful mm -hmm. collaborations? Um, you know, I was thinking of the Lilly Endowment and right. that and his work in Indianapolis in the 80s and where a foundation really have had an impact, and, and what was it about their strategy that worked? Yeah, I do that too. I think yeah. Chapman. Yeah. 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 So I'm wondering, you know, to what extent you're looking at both historical models and um, regional models? Yeah, uh, no, it's, it's a terrific question. And it's one of the reasons um, I'm nervous about this big new economy fund. I mean, so we have $100 million, and what, what are we going to do with it? Um, and why do we think that the most massive constriction in the history of Michigan is going to get turned around by a philanthropic collaborator? I mean, you know, it's 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 a deep stuff. But to answer your question, um, my sense is that the local foundation in community in, in Detroit is really acutely sensitive to its failures in the past, and, and they talk a lot about what happened then and why. It a, um, what they're not so good at, I think, what we are not so good at, is then projecting out and saying, all right, based on that, therefore, what we need to do is, um, you know, I, I think 
it's just, it's, it's, it is sort of a leap of faith, and I think it maybe goes back to your question, is that um, I think you just ultimately have to invest in what you know needs to be invested in. And you try to tool up properly, you try to scale up properly, um, but ultimately you, the, the alternative is unacceptable. And I know that for some of our foundation board members, the alternative of walking away from Detroit is very real. I mean, it, our, I have board members who cannot imagine why we would know the history of Detroit and invest another dime. And that's going to be a very complex dynamic to manage. Um, so, uh, you know, I, th I, I think you, you just have got to kind of put one foot in front of the other. Uh, the, 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 one, the other thing that I think may be a little bit different um, and maybe it's not, but we now have 40 years of history in Detroit in which we have lost ground rather than gained ground. And I think in many ways that is unique in America. And one of the hopes I have is that Kresge, because it does play on, and why I think it's so important for us to play on the national stage, is I think we can essentially become something of a bridge to some of the national learning, expertise, and money that, that is out there. And so, I'm hoping that one of the things that we can do is, is to become much more intentional, much more informed, and much more strategic based on what people have done other places. Now, transplanting that stuff to Detroit is, is a risky proposition, but I have no doubt that what the Andy Casey Foundation has done in East Baltimore is relevant to what we do. I know what we did in Minneapolis is relevant in some pieces to what we do. Well, it should be. Heinz should be. I mean, you do have communities that have gone through sort of similar disinvestment cycles. And I think asking the question, Joel, we were talking about this earlier, asking the question about what role did philanthropy play, even if it's small, um, to, to help provide some small catalytic spark to that is useful. Um, but there is, a, maybe again, back to the earlier question, there is a real, I uh, think, risk of grandiosity in all of this. There is no way that Kresge can, can zoom in and provide any number of silver bullets to Detroit. It's going to be long, hard, difficult, glue here, catalyst there, acceleration there, and reinforcement there. But those are all uh, those are all small gestures that I think over time can make a difference. So it's, I think it's mostly a leap of faith. I have Alden, but his wife may take precedence. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As always. <laughs> well, I, I know and love Detroit having grown up there, and I now spend a week or so a month there uh, trying to get a handle on the kinds of things that you talked about and look for those opportunities to bring people together, the collaborations, the kind of staying power that, that Kresge has exhibited, um, uh, I think is terribly important. And I think the, the, the people of Detroit and Michigan in general, but particularly southeastern Michigan, are so desperate right now um, that um, this is a very opportune time for the kind of collaborative effort that you're describing. Um, and Conversations, you know, who's in the conversation in Detroit, as you know, is, is, is terribly important. And it sounds as though you're trying to get players in the conversation that need to be there, and you can work your angles uh, who, who will collaborate in this neighborhood and, and who might be willing to uh, come into the downtown revitalization effort to help it expand throughout the city. Um, so I, I really applaud what you're doing. Um, I think it's, it's absolutely essential. And in my own experience, when a, a system is broken, you don't try to fix it over and over and over, expending um, millions and billions of dollars trying to fix a system that's broken. You create something alongside of it that does work. It may be small to begin with, like a charter school that works in a, a public school system that is uh, one of the worst in the country. And then see how that might revitalize a neighborhood and then model that in another neighborhood. And so it's by bits and pieces uh, that this web gets woven uh, and becomes part of the fabric of the city. Uh, so That's a much more all, the, way of all the best <coughs> your Let me ask Ed a constant <coughs> question. Um, has there been any commitment by Kresge in terms of money and time in which that money will be spent? When you give away 150 million a year, 
How much of this will go to Detroit for mm -hmm. one? Yeah, and that's been part of the problem with this so-called initiative. It's been transactional. We just sort of say, well, when we get a when we get a grant, we'll pay for it. Um, what 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 we're looking at is setting aside 15 to 20 percent of our annual payout um, for well, I was going to say for at least the next 15 years. I think there are board members who are going to chafe at that and say you've got to have some reasonable benchmarks to, to demonstrate whether that money is, is effective or not. Um, but in the community development business, that's a, that's a tricky business. And I, I think that I think probably what we're looking at is a, is a very long-term commitment. I don't think it can be three years. It can't be five years, like even ten years. But you know, once you get out beyond three years. So it's clearly, when you're going into this with your eyes open, the board knows that it's risky business. Yes, I think so. And can't be looking for immediate success, which can, could be a problem if the board doesn't is aware of it. You know, and given the expertise around the table, I mean, one thing that, that, that is intriguing to me is that it seems to me that there is a shakeout going on in the Detroit regional economy. Um, that, that really does change the dynamic fundamentally. I, one of the lessons you clearly get looking backward is that there was such a high reliance on the, in this region on the autos to fix anything. It didn't matter what it was, whether it was race relations, whether it was job creation, whether it was tax base. And that, that the, the autos will always be a part of this economy. But my sense is that what you are seeing is the initial stirrings of the diversification it's actually kind of interesting. Um, all of a sudden, the healthcare systems, as they are in so many communities, are emerging as really important frontline um, institutions in terms of jobs, in terms of broader community revitalization efforts, in terms of stabilizing the housing market. It's a very different. It's a very different business. And I think what the other thing that we're seeing is that the Wayne State University system is beginning to play a sort of a more integral. It's never been, you know, on anyone's top five for the universities, but it has it trains more nurses than any other institution in the United States. Um, it trains 90% um, of all practicing lawyers in, in the state of Michigan. I mean, it's, uh, the numbers are unbelievable. And so, when you actually begin thinking about different constellations of um, of groups, it seems to me that you may want to sort of come at this with a slightly different strategy. And think about how some of those sort of anchors of long-term community repositioning can can be enhanced. Now, what that means, I don't know. But um, those of you who are specialists in capital and, and other things, I would be delighted to hear. But I, th I think there is sort of a, a shifting strategy, uh, realizing that the autos are no longer the salvation of that economy. Well, I was just going to ask a follow-up question. This Detroit focus, which obviously is sort of an issue fo focus for you, how, how are you doing from a staffing point of view yeah. to move into that? Because I would think that provides you with your first vehicle to bring in a different kind of a staff. Because uh, it's going to require, I mean, people who are used to doing capital grants aren't going to be community builders, it seems to me. Yeah. Um. One of the, <laughs> to put it mildly. Well, yes, yeah, so maybe a, <laughs> a pun there. Um, one of the, this is, this is really difficult stuff, but one of the challenges of coming into a, um, a system that has been in place for quite so long is it's hard to know whether the people in the system are there because that's the environment they prefer to work in or whether they would like to work in plan to be and this is, their version of adaptation. And so, you know, given the fact that I've been there only seven months, I made a I made a very early decision not to change a single staff person. And to just sort of say, if you take the fence line, if you take the lid off, how do they perform? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the this is more detailed than one, but one of the good pieces of news is that the people who are in our Detroit team, five or six people, all our younger staff that have been there less long than some of the others, are really spectacular. And they are just chomping at the bit 
to um, to do a different kind of work. Now, whether they're capable of, of it, whether we need to supplement that, those skills, I don't know. I actually think we will have a more severe challenge with things like healthcare, education, maybe even arts and culture, uh, because I think they're, they're the kind of expertise that a generalist brings is going to pretty soon kind of run up against its logical limit. But actually, the Detroit people um, are quite strong and, and have had backgrounds in different nonprofit work in Detroit. Uh, one of them was the community investment banker for the largest bank in the region for years and years, so she's used to dealing with the community. Everybody knows her. So it, it may be actually a Thank you for the lecture in the morning and the presentation. And then, uh, I think you intentionally uh, did a little bit of separate uh, topics. And then, but I can find the consistency in your lecture in the morning. And you now. can or cannot? I, I can. Oh, wow. I can find it. But in terms of the MI topic in the community development, and then I, th I heard that you made a, a change in your foundation, the, the challenge grant. And then, in the traditionally, your foundation just made a requirement, and they just see the requirements, the matching for the organizations. And then you announced that with your foundation will introduce their value evaluation and the mission and the, the, the impact on their on the community and the community of their program project. Is it right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think you are the three-tier model it uh, reflects and represents your uh, your concept you brought uh, brought up to your community your foundation. And then my question is, in there in terms of the community uh, development, community uh, the, and their impact on the community. And then you made you you added the the, the criteria and the, the what on what to, to what the organizations you will give the, the, the award and the grant. And then the, my question is, I'm researching on the, the Chicago David project in the uh, Biomedical Foundation. Oh. And then the foundations usually give the money to separate non-profit organizations in the neighborhood. And then the organizations, the, the small organizations have a separate goals. And then the, the, it's not related to each other. And then like, um, how do you, could you combine and where you, you could suggest uh, the generalized criteria to compare which is better for the, or for the community in, in, in terms of the impact? Because you should evaluate and you, you, you announced you will evaluate the, the impact of the community development. Then could you suggest any your uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I'm tracking exactly. I think the question, yeah. if I understand it, is uh, rather than give grants to individual organizations, uh -huh. is it possible to think about some kind of a cooperative, coordinated strategy uh -huh. among the organizations uh -huh. to improve the neighborhood? Uh, right? Yeah, that's one thing. And another thing is you're, but I, I, I have a difficulty in evaluating their separate programs, in right. the, the same day, even though in the same community, community. I see. And then you you evaluate some impact of their on, on their community, and then what kind of criteria you will apply and you will use and you will utilize. In your well, I, well I, that that's a, that's a very good question indeed, and I I, I, I think we we really don't know. Yet. I mean, I think how how you how you measure community success. Uh, there's a lot of literature out there. Um, a lot of thinking that's been done, but uh, I think it goes back to the earlier question. I, I think that that is not something we've struggled with. The evaluation has not been part of our arsenal. Up until now, the way we evaluated a project success is whether we got a snapshot of the finished building. Um, you know, it's, I literally mean that. That was the sort of final thing that we got at Presby. Um, and so this notion of uh, how you introduce evaluation mechanisms, uh, how you develop the staff expertise, how important is it, how much do you sort of fly uh, blind for a while and sort of on faith that you're doing something useful that's more than just interesting, you know, it, those are hard questions. But this, uh, this interesting question, if I understand Joel's rephrasing of it, it, I think is an interesting one. In Chicago, some of you may know, um, MacArthur is essentially 
done a wholesale grant to Chicago LISC, Local Commission of Support Corporation, in, in asked LISC to essentially then coordinate the redevelopment strategies in 16 Chicago neighborhoods. Very complex deal. Um, I think when you can when you can find intermediaries of that confidence um, and have high confidence in their ability to, to deliver, it's a great strategy. But the list in Chicago is unlike any list anywhere in the country. It is, it is a complete machine. And um, uh, I would cooperate with one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think your answer, I mean, the answer is, I think you need to, to figure out <clears throat> Both, you know, but yeah, could, would would one objective be to create intermediary organizations at the neighborhood level that have the capacity to sort of work closer to the ground than a foundation could? Absolutely. Um, we at McKnight did that. We had a rural development program at McKnight, in which we capitalized almost 30 years ago. Six community foundations, essentially, that covered the entire state, called initiative funds. And the whole point was is that we had worked so intensively in Minneapolis and St. Paul that rural Minnesota said, why aren't you paying any attention to rural Minnesota? And we said, we just can't pretend to know what, how Duluth differs from International Falls, how Duluth differs from Mankato. And so we provided modest capitalization together with the state legislature to create these funds. And now, 25 years later, they are extraordinarily impressive intermediaries. They, they are now all $40 to $50 million foundations, they make business loans, they're very close to the community, they all have sort of signature initiatives that I think are suitable to the customized needs of, of, of local organizations. And our McKnight board often said, why can't we do that in an urban area? Why don't you have the equivalent of an initiative fund in an urban area? And I think the texture is just more complicated. Um, but it's not a bad idea. Can I ask you why you never used the phrase University of Michigan? Uh -huh. I mean, uh, uh, I'm mentioning Wayne State, though. I understand, but I mean, I'm just thinking of a powerhouse place that produces tons of literature and tons of subjects having to do with urban and other areas. It's not that interesting in Detroit either. But, I mean, but <laughs> no, no, but I understand that. I mean, that's what I want you to talk about. Well, I think I think the this new economic initiative school fund is being driven by a couple of economists at the University of Michigan. And I think their hope is that that as we sort of create the intellectual underpinnings for that machinery, that we'll really will call on the University of Michigan. And, and the University of Michigan is stepping forward to try to do intellectual property development or commercialization in a big way. Um, and if in fact that becomes sort of one of the, the key strategies for this new economic initiative. I think you'll see more interaction with the University of England. I have been struck at how, although it's, what, who said it's 23 miles away, it, it's, it's a different planet. It's a different planet. It's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to know why. I guess I just haven't been in Detroit long enough to figure out why, but there's, you almost never hear the University of Michigan talk about in any conversation about the future of Detroit. The difference between night and day between the University of Minnesota, for example, which has long been engaged in yes. and, and the University of Michigan, which hasn't. Yeah. So and Jackson yeah. Hill here has been very much engaged in the state in the way that um, Minnesota has or Wisconsin has, but Michigan takes just a totally different set of people. Yeah, I don't know why. It's a really interesting question. Sit down and talk to them. I'm kind of, are you, are you as you read on this initiative, along the way, are you developing a sort of a learning um, document so that you can track mistakes that were made, things that were, that, that's one question. And secondly, you know, I, I'm already looking at your success in the end part of it, um, as I've seen it sort of in Pittsburgh with the Heinz um, endowment. But often success leads to new failures or new social woes. And, and as many of us in the foundation world work in, work on these revitalization um, revitalization projects and we see it become successful um, sort of the as you build it they will come and it pushes out people and creates oh. the ring effect and I'm wondering and I haven't seen an example of how to address where you where communities have been revitalized how do you address the gentrification effectively without it becoming um, sort of a handout you know 
I'm smiling because one of Joel's um, students this morning asked this question using Washington U Street in Washington as an example, saying, you know, because my first response, completely inadequate, was, well, we should be so lucky to have that problem in Detroit. Uh, and she said, well, you know, the same thing could have been said about uh, portions of Northwest and North Central Washington. You've just got to be planful and intentional. And I frankly hadn't thought about that. I mean, it, it, you know, we now have a community in Detroit that is um, you know, 83% African American. The poverty statistics are just unbelievable. And so the idea that somehow we would be so successful as to think about how do you sort of, how do you create mixed income communities that work, multiracial communities that work, seems so far mm -hmm. in the distance that it's hard to think about it. But I think you're right. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a snappy answer to that. I think we should think about it, and we should sort of anticipate what would success look like, and how do you avoid the unintended consequences of success. What about the first question about keeping track in terms of oh, learning? Uh, we, it's a little bit like evaluation. It's a little bit like your savvy question. There is sort of no tradition of, of learning. Um, I, I, one, one of the first things I asked the staff when I came to Kresge is, so we are the only organization in the country um, that does these sort of capital projects. What would we tell the rest of the world? What do we have? We have over 20 years of, of experience. I assume that we have a lot to tell people about how projects are capitalized, what's successful, what's not successful, how do you avoid you know, making mistakes. And so I think this becomes an opportunity to, to, to do exactly that. And we actually do have someone on staff who, who's sort of charged with sort of at least keeping tabs on you know, recording sort of the, the progress we're making. Um, but again, I guess I'm being a little bit myopic. It, it seems so early in a process that it seems so changeable that the idea of sort of documenting what we're doing just uh, seems overwhelming. But um, again, I think it's a mostly a good suggestion. I think we need to think about how do you capture some of the learning. Because I think, I think actually, I mean, I, I hope I haven't been too annoying in, 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 in my certainties here. I, I think this is a huge crapshoot. I think this is very difficult stuff. I think we will move toward the capitalization model in a reasonably effective way. But how you do that, how you pick your bets, how you make sure that you're not being capricious and just sort of playing to what's interesting rather than what's important, those are really hard questions. And, um, and so I, I think uh, I'm not at all sure that we will be successful. And I think the one thing we need to be committed to is letting people know when we're not. You know, I know that's a cliche, but foundations are notoriously bad at that. You've got a handful foundations who talk about the things that went haywire. Um, Four. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think, I think, unfortunately, there's a, a good amount that may go haywire, including some of these questions. I don't, I really, you know, I'm sort of haunted by your question because I think it's a really good one. Including the idea that we may, we may be moving off ground that is not particularly sexy, but may well be more valuable than we think. And so that's why the grandmother's China piece, I think we really need to hang on to that. It would have been easy just to wipe the slate completely clean and just say, you got a new foundation, let's just invent something. We're not doing that. I'm trying to build out, it's, even though that little box is small, we are trying to build out what we know and what we do. And so I think, um, I'm hoping that that will be some protection against a complete capriciousness. Thank you very much. It's all very interesting. We're uh, running out of time. Fascinating, actually fascinating story. It's a big challenge. We all, our hearts are all with you. <laughs> in making, in, 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 in about it, in achieving what you'd like to achieve. Um, let me remind you that we have two more of these sessions this spring semester. One on the 11th of, uh, of April uh, with a totally different kind of foundation that we haven't had, actually had anybody to do with before. The Jeff Foundation in New York. Um, which is very much at the cutting edge of things dealing with very controversial issues, um, human rights issues, political issues in some cases. Um, and it's unusual in another respect because this foundation is not endowed. It is, it is given by a single donor somewhere around 35 to $45 million a year, every year. Uh, and the donor and the 
the, uh, and the, and the, and the director of the foundation who is coming down to speak, not the donor's not coming, but the director of the foundation's coming, um, and has really done a marvelous job of positioning that foundation in the, in, in the space that they were really interested in doing. Bob Crane is his name, and so that would be very interesting. And we then had a bonus, which I hadn't counted on, but I, we sent out an email to you all that Judy Roden happens to be coming down uh, and is offered to spend as much of, of, of the day of the 20th as we'd like her to make. And so we're, we're trying to figure out what the best, it also happens to be the day of the Public Policy Board of Visitors meeting. And so there's a little negotiation going on with Bruce Cunningham to try to figure out he would like to have her too. And so I don't know what the time is going to be on that day. It's a Friday, uh, but we're going to do something. And as you know, Judy Roden is very much in the headlines these days because she's taken over the Rockefeller Foundation, which hasn't had a very a, a substantial structural change um, in, I would say, 100 years, and uh, not quite that long. But in any event, there's been a lot of press about the changes that she's made and the people she's replaced and, and a lot of the decisions that she's making here. So it will be fascinating uh, to hear what she has to say. So that's going to be on the 20th sometime. Could be lunch. It cannot, be, it cannot be lunch because she's speaking at the reason she's coming to town. No, but she's at lunch. She's come, no, but no, she's coming up over there on Thursday. Yeah, she's speak, coming in Thursday night. She's eating supper with me Thursday night. And on Friday at noon, she well, is running the conference that kicks off. The I will tell them that you said that because, yeah. because she, what she said in the email to me was that she was, she was finished at Chapel Hills on Thursday evening but was free to come over here on Thursday. Because she was originally coming down on Wednesday. Well, they got there confused in any event. I'll yeah. just tell them that I understand from you yeah. that, that the conference doesn't start. But you know what? what? I'm not even going to argue this because they changed it two times on me as well. Okay. But I think she's probably had the same problem. Well, in any event, yeah. she'll, she's going to come over here sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know when that's going to be. But I well, she well, she well, this will actually let you know where But in any event, uh, so, so that those are the two last things. And I, I think that's it for now. And I thank you all for coming. And I thank you again.